do the qualification, so I, I didn't have to. Uh, I don't do data. I don't uh, really do policy, and uh, I don't do sort of environmental uh, activism or I do engineering education primarily. Um, uh, but I, uh, my dissertation advisor was a policy theorist, uh, and sort of he gave me a framework that I've not at all directly uh, applied in my work moving forward, but in a thousand ways indirectly. So I decided to sort of go back and resurrect some of the insights from that to provide a framework. But between that uh, introduction to uh, uh, scholarship in, in this policy theory realm uh, and a little bit of theorizing of expertise uh, and where I am now solidly in engineering curriculum design, I had a period uh, where I did a little bit of work in design studies. So I thought, well, the policy framework fits here. The design, and, and Katina actually asked me, suggested, well, I know you have some of this background in design. You can do something on uh, design and stakeholder engagement. So I said, okay, well, I know a little bit about this space. Um, so the, the uh, presentation is an effort to like say, okay, well, what from design might uh, tell an interesting story in the context of data-driven environmental policy? So, so that's my framework. Uh, I may have a few too many slides, but really the, sli the slides are, are, are my, my narrative uh, textualized which in this wonderful room is a, is a shame uh, uh, to have a limited PowerPoint such as that. Um, but it gives me an outline and, and something for you to follow along with. So, you know, what makes good policy and, and policy uh, uh, both in this talk and in the work of, of my advisor is taken uh, very broadly. So, uh, my advisor was Edward Woodhouse. His advisor was Charles Lindblom so in the policy making world. Uh, these, uh, these guys are well, Lindblom in particular is super well known, uh, and they have this book, The Policy Making uh, Process, which is the densest 150 pages you will read uh, for sure. But their, their framework sort of has these three pre uh, 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 presumptions. Uh, first, uncertainty and disagreement are fundamental facts of political life, and of course this is really important. So disagreement is the, is the politics side, of course we know that people have uh, disagreement and, and value things differently. Uh, but the uncertainty, uh, the, the fundamentality of uncertainty provides an opening for thinking about expertise and processes for managing uh, science intersecting with policy in ways that are politically robust, uh, and entail the use of the expertise, but also recognize its limitations and the need for political process. Um, competition of ideas, uh, they see as the central mechanism for pluralist democracy. Uh, they are uh, uh, um, uh, sort of, um, uh, I'm sorry, a partisan, plur their, their framework is a partisan plur uh, plural plurality. So we have lots of different interests, interest groups competing with each other, and through that competition, the, uh, both the knowledge and the values get sorted. Uh, uh, so that's, that's pluralism, but of course, as all uh, uh, criticisms of pluralism recognize, the competition is, uh, is unfair and stacked towards the interests of the elites, and well, we hear that story all the time, including in the prior presentation, including in the presentation before that. Uh, this is another, uh, mm -hmm. probably a fundamental fact of political life. So, um, in the preface, they say, you know, given, given uh, the, these challenges, uh, helping ordinary people to think more clearly about social problems and possibilities is the best hope for shaping a better world. And from policy folks uh, who focus on the, the protocols and procedures for structuring political, that is situated in political institutions, decision making, uh, this focus on ordinary people I think is, is pretty compelling. Now, so if I if I sort of think about through my uh, through Woodhouse like what justifies participation in government, uh, uh, his whole career is built around uh, decision making protocols that result in what he would call wise and fair decision making. So uh, I've always thought about the wise and fair uh, combination as a combination as the two sides. Uh, of, of uh, an appropriate 
specification. The whys being the right content, that's facts, but also perspectives, interests, and values, uh, and for the right reasons, and this is this competition of ideas and the potential intelligence of democracy, democratic process. And then fair is that people have a right to participate in decisions that impact them, sort of fundamental democratic theory. And that right exists irrespective of the facts, the perspectives, the interests, and the values that they bring to the table. <clears throat> so uh, in STS, which is the field I'm trained in with Kurt, uh, in policy studies, and then also in design studies, there's a lot of attention to questions of stakeholder participation. <clears throat> but most of it falls on the, on the wise side, on the potential intelligence. We do this because it contributes this insight or perspective or fact or um, uh, 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 value that, that is crucial. So in my abstract, I characterize this as sort of the instrumentalist justifications for participation. And there are many, <coughs> and they're great, and they're proliferated, and that's great. Legitimation, like the, the, for democracy to work as a social institution, it needs to have legitimation. And legitimation comes from participation. <clears throat> participation also brings uh, contextual detail and nuance, local knowledge. In STS, there's a lot of great theorization of, of expertise and its boundaries and its limits, but also different categories of expertise, including the expertise embedded in lay uh, interest groups. Uh, that adds not only contextual knowledge, but a whole distinct knowledge system with its own sense of integrity that contributes to uh, decision-making uh, processes. And then, of course, this came up a lot in Kurt's talk and even more in Eric's talk, uh, the role of deliberation and that, um, that participating and collaborating across differences actually drives learning. Mm. And that learning then enables mutual accommodation, right? It's much, and I guess uh, Eric used the language of empathy, mm. right? But it's not just that you have empathy for another person. In the political context, that empathy has to translate to a willingness to give a little and give a little, right? That mutual accommodation. Okay, uh, so, so that's the framework. <clears throat> so Woodhouse has this rights, uh, wise and fair framework and yet most of the policy making process and most of the work in STS and um, uh, policy studies that I'm aware of is focusing on the potential intelligence side, the, the fairness. What about the rights-based justification for participation? So um, I don't have an answer to this, and maybe you guys do, but I'm going to sort of speculate as, a, as an opening and then look at sort of how this uh, sort of discourse has evolved in, in design studies. So, are the rights presumed but implicit? Do we all just assume, well, of course, democracy is good? Well, of course, stakeholders should be able to participate whenever possible? Do we just presume it so we don't have to say it? Hmm. Or is the instrumentalist logic that, well, we need a reason for people to participate? People shouldn't just participate for any old reasons besides democracy, but like we need a reason. We need an instrumentalist logic. So we can't quite presume that rights-based discourse alone is sufficient. And then a lesser version of that alone is strategic. Or have we actually given up on rights-based justifications altogether? Have we become com comfortable with, uh, not to mention really good at identifying the instrumentalist justification for participation? <clears throat> so <clears throat> if I gloss the history of design scholarship around users, I see a very interesting retreat from rights-based discourse over the last 50 years. Now I'm on, on tape, so I really need to qualify here. Uh, uh, you know, you don't need to be a historian to know that uh, uh, historical uh, cycles don't uh, arrive in neatly packaged decade uh, time frames. Uh, so this is really just an organizing mnemonic more than it is a, a fair history. Most of these movements originate around this time and then have a history of opening up over the following uh, years and into the following decades such that they intersect 
uh, and cross-pollinate in ways that this linear uh, framing doesn't show. And yet still, we're, I'm gonna sort of document what feels, what, what, what I think is a justifiable trend in, uh, around sort of how designers who think a lot about users and user engagement, how they frame what's going on there. So 1970s and cooperative design. Cooperative design uh, has become uh, known more uh, uh, commonly today as participatory design, uh, arose in the context of co-determination laws. Co-determination co laws have a long history in the US and Europe, but basically that workers in a workplace environment have a right to participate in decision making in that context. Often it's worker representation on board of directors for corporations. But in the, um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, uh, sort of cooperative design became a really compelling uh, movement, particularly in Scandinavia uh, in the 70s, mm. around creating um, uh, workplace technologies, particularly in the context of com the computerized workplace, that empower uh, workers. And, and as an alternative to the, the predominant trend of computer de-skilling workers, yeah? So uh, central concerns here are uh, quality of work life, and really interesting in the cooperative and, and participatory design literature, explicit attention to rights discourse, both that workers have the right to participate in the design process, but also that they have a right to design outcomes that serve their interests, right? So explicit attention to wise and fair across this whole design movement. All right, that's seven. 1980s, socially responsible design. So uh, uh, socially responsible design, sort of a la Victor Papanek, design for the real world, and, and tangentially maybe E.F. Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, which is more uh, in the uh, uh, mid-70s, but becoming more popular uh, through the 80s, uh, is the sort of uh, 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 effort to uh, redirect designers away from traditional consumerist practices and toward uh, social interest groups that are, are not well represented by design outcomes. Uh, uh, not, uh, tightly uh, bound up with the 70s political progressivism. Uh, I mentioned Schumacher, who was uh, often considered the, the grandfather of uh, appropriate technology movement, a la Gandhi, but that's another story. Um, uh, Victor Papanek was big on design for uh, needs, not wants. Our students love that phrase. It really mm. bothers me, but uh, not for the reasons uh, that the students love it. Uh, and um, uh, But interesting is the sort of attention to designers accommodating the needs of the, the, the <coughs> life needs of underrepresented uh, or underserved communities is that the users uh, really provide the need and then the designer the expertise. Uh, now, the users also provide input along the way, and appropriate technology movement has a lot of successes with participatory design and user engagement, uh, but also lots of, of failures, and not a lot of attention to the relationship between the designer and the user. And the concerns here, uh, the rights of underserved uh, uh, social groups, and, and still explicit attention to questions of fairness, and expli explicit attention to elite domination of the design. Next group, user-centered design. So user-centered design was uh, coined by Donald Norman. His most famous book is The Design of Everyday Things. His prior book is uh, User-Centered System Design, which is a book on uh, human-computer interaction. So Donald Norman is a psychologist turned design scholar uh, and uh, very interested in everyday life experience in parentheses of typical Western consumers, right? So we see some of the uh, attention to the, the designer-user relationship, but we start to lose the political loading of participatory design. And uh, the, in, the focus on everyday lives and the mundane sort of carries over from the prior movements. Uh, but then he, so the, the sort of criticism and alternatives to consumerist design context is now gone. Uh, designers uh, uh, work uh, 
intimately with users, both to validate, uh, or primarily to val validate their design concepts uh, with the users. Uh, interesting for, for uh, Norman is uh, that the, um, the user's uh, uh, experience is paramount. So what the, the pain the user feels is what needs to be addressed because that's going to change in the next iteration. Uh, central concerns are the emotional and experiential uh, dimensions of object interactions, and this no doubt is informed by Norman's training as a psychologist and optimizing uh, quality of engagement and product to fit existing user needs. So the idea is the user sort of goes through the world and when that, wherever there's a point of friction, the designer swoops in and smooths it out so that people sort of don't notice the world. Okay, uh, following this and now sort of we're getting into the, the, the present uh, era of design thinking, of uh, design uh, scholarship, uh, human-centered design, so moving from the user to the human, uh, is itself rhetorically an, an interesting shift. Um, uh, but the context and characteristics, uh, still the, there's the direct interaction with the users, but the shift really is from identifying friction points to just observing people navigating their world and identifying problems irrespective of the user's experience. So whereas Norman wanted to reduce friction, the human-centered design movement is people don't even know what their problems are. We're so used to accommodating that the designer can observe people's behavior and identify opportunities for innovation irrespective of the user's experience. Yeah? However, the, the user's experience doesn't disappear because you still need to work with the users uh, iteratively both to propose solutions and to validate those, uh, those solutions. So although users aren't really good at identifying their problems before you give them a solution, as soon as you give them the solution, they have a lot to say about whether or not it's viable or how it fits into their lives. And now sort of, we've kind of normalized this as consumers and with gadgets coming in our lives, right? We normalize a model whereby all sorts of creative solutions to problems we didn't know we have are arising and we're just like, yeah, I need that, right? Like all of us, I didn't know I need it, but now that it exists, I totally need it. Uh, the central concerns now were totally like rights are way, way off the table, even needs. It's really just uh, optimized uh, satisfaction, well being, uh, a lot of attention to innovation, meaning making, play. Uh, and interestingly, the human centered design movement you know, like, has a rhetoric of, well, this isn't consumer craft, this is making, like, this is well being, right? Mm -hmm. And yet it still utterly presumes a consumerist framework. Like the way innovation is enabled is by the resource basis of like you turn all good design ideas into a consumer product service system. All right, and now sort of into the present era in design thinking. <clears throat> so design thinking is sort of the world of the Stanford D School and IDEO, which is a private uh, intersecting uh, institution uh, with the D school um, is uh, in many regards it's sort of the, the broad basing of human-centered design design for everyone like everyone can and better everyone should be a designer everyone should be a designer I mean it's it's really something to say right everyone should be an architect everyone should be an epidemiologist everyone should um, and yet, uh, uh, there's, there's something there. But of course, as soon as you make that broad basing move, the need to sort of strip out the methodological rigor, the conceptual, all of that, like, design is really just an attitude. It's a shirt you can wear if you choose the right color. Um, uh, characteristics, co-evolution of problem and solution. So a lot of the human-centered design uh, characteristics come on, but emphasized in, in design thinking in particular is co-evolution of problem and solution. And this is a formalization of this sort of sense that we don't know what we need until the solution is posed, right? It's actually formalizing in the method, like, ah, the problems don't matter. We'll figure out the problems as we go, right? Uh, and, and, and the context is key, right? Because problems are experienced in context, so we need to <laughs> attend to how people interact with their contexts. But no particular problem and no particular context matters. 
It's really just a process. And then you strip away all the richness of localized knowledge and relationships and uh, uh, the specifics of any, of any, uh, of the details of any context. Uh, central concerns here, and this was where I think it starts to get really, really problematic. Uh, although it's all about, um, in some sense, users in the human centered design framework, uh, the concern is promoting the designer, the worldview, the, the promoting the method. Uh, and uh, I made a comment in my uh, talk yesterday that was pulled fr from this one. Uh, uh, Vin, uh, uh, I'm losing his, his name now. Uh, uh, Lee Vinzel from Virginia Tech is a, a quite outspoken critic of design thinking. Uh, uh, and uh, he has a more provocative quote that I said yesterday, but he's really critical of the focus that design thinking really focuses on uh, empowering the designer. Like, you can change the world. You can transform society through design creativity. And the user sort of, it, it's, it's, just, it's just fodder for the, the design process. The user's problems are fodder for the design process. And human uh, problems in context remain ten, uh, central, but tend toward, tend toward becoming just fodder. All right, so uh, implications. Uh, can design uh, help us think about stakeholder participation in science, uh, in data-rich science? I, I think definitely. I think the attention to, to user experiences I think attention to users contextualized meaning making, the relationship between the user and the context and the problem and hence the solution. Uh, and I think the attention to uh, how users empiric how users navigate the problem solving and the empirical methods for observing and, uh, and, and learning from users in their uh, ordinary environments, I think that those are all directly translatable into this space. Uh, can designers help us think about stakeholder participation in science? Probably. Well, attention to the designer user interactions. I think it's rich. I think in, the, in, in a, Eric's talk, it was like, oh, we're problem agnostic. We're just facilitators of conversations between these people and these people. Well, designers, too, think of themselves as facilitators. Designers are absolutely process-oriented people, yet designers have a huge stake in mm -hmm. the outcome, too. So the relationship between the sort of the decision maker and the stakeholder and the facilitator and the solution poser, which need not be the decision maker, right? That gets all into play. And designers have thought about in their own way, very interesting ways of, uh, of, of those different interests intersecting and the designer embodying different roles. A uh, lot of attention uh, to methods a lot of attention to methods of engagement in particular. Much of it is superficial, and the, the cultural anthropologists freak out when the designers say we use ethnography, right? Because it's nothing like the anthropologists understand ethnography, ethnography to be. But designers do have a lot of attention for quick and dirty uh, methods for interacting with users. Uh, and, and attention to validation of design contexts. And that came up a little bit again also in Eric's talk. Right, like people are testing the model, right? Mm -hmm. Validation, ongoing validation and solution iteration is really, really important, and designers have, have thought about that. Uh, so then I'll just end with the, the, the question, you know, how, how can the historical trends in uh, user-oriented design inform contemporary science decision-making? Uh, systematic attention to countering elite domination, we see. Uh, we see a precedent for uh, attention to user rights early uh, in design scholarship. I think we see an interesting interweaving of rights-based and inner instrumentalist justifications in, in sort of the design scholarship. And I think we see simultaneous attention uh, to process and outcome. And I think those are all, uh, all valuable and extendable. But also, we see a trending away from rights-based justification. And I suspect, I mean, I guess I should wonder, but I suspect uh, we see that in, the, in, in user engagement in science, uh, in data-rich science as well. A trending away from commitment to identifiable underserved uh, community groups, and then a sort of perversely ironic trend 
sort of designer empowerment. Hmm. And that I don't necessarily suspect exists, but I do wonder in the sort of data space, like what, what role does the facilitator play? In, like what, in what ways are the interests of the facilitator <coughs> at stake in these processes? I mean, what does it mean to say we're problem agnostic? Like what does that mean politically uh, in, in the context uh, of a context like this? Uh, yeah, that's my talk. Thanks for uh, having me. Thank you.